Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Healthy Aging Lecture. Our topic today is Medicare ABCs, and we timed this topic to coincide with um, the upcoming enrollment period that starts October 15th. Um, let me first introduce myself briefly. I'm Kate. I'm the manager in the senior health department here at Virginia Hospital Center, and I'm joined with my coworker Blanca there on the screen. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to introduce our two guest speakers, um, and they will kind of lead us through a discussion about kind of unpacking Medicare, and if you're someone that's approaching 65, you are 65, wherever you might be in that, we're hopeful, hopeful this um, presentation will give you some tips and strategies to make the most of your benefit. So let me just remind you, in case you're new to our uh, webinar format, you're all in listen-only mode which just helps reduce that background noise, but we definitely encourage your contributions in questions. So check out the control panel that you see over on your screen, wherever you have it placed. There should be a question box. Use that to type in questions. We're gonna be fielding questions as we go because there's a lot to digest. And so it, sometimes it's easier to take them as they come up. So um, for example, as John's moving along, he'll pause every once in a while and we'll take some questions. So. Definitely get those in the box, in the, in the chat box, um, and, and we'll get to them. I um, want to remind everyone that our webinar is recorded. All of our Healthy Aging Lecture webinars are recorded. So whether, even if you registered for one and you didn't attend, we send all of the recordings out. They're free. You can listen to them anytime, re-listen to it, send it to a friend or family member. Um, so we definitely encourage you to take advantage of that feature. Um, so I believe that is all of the kind of upfront business that I wanted to take care of. I'm going to introduce our two speakers and let them get rolling. Um, today, we're first going to hear from John Norse, who is the founder of Medicare Portal. Uh, Medicare Portal is based in Fairfax County. I know John will be able to tell us a little bit more about it, but their um, organization, John is the founder of the organization and they help people navigate through their Medicare journey, providing education, resources, services, whatever it may be. And I know John has been in the Medicare and insurance space since 1990, I believe, if I uh, remember correctly. And then after John talks, we're gonna turn it over to Gloria Baziri, and she is an outreach and caregiver specialist for Arlington County area on aging. Um, and she also kind of outside of that role, she does a lot of work um, in geriatric care management. So we're really glad to have her. She'll be able to speak to some Arlington specific resources that may be helpful for you if you're a resident here in Arlington County. So with that, I am going to, um, first of all, thank our guests for being here today and giving us their uh, time and, and their expertise. And I'm gonna turn it over to John to get us rolling. Thanks, Kate. Can you see the presentation? then yes we can john we're good okay. i'll get rolling thanks again kate thanks for everything thanks for the opportunity good morning everyone uh, my name is john norse uh, i am the founder and president of medicare portal uh, just quickly so you know who we are uh, we are technically based in tyson's corner that's our physical presence although we serve the entire mid-atlantic we actually serve 22 additional states or 21 additional states uh, in addition to virginia we are what's known as an independent Medicare insurance agency. Uh, we are certified uh, by Medicare to represent products in the Medicare space that complement Medicare. Uh, our goal is education up front, and you'll see today I'll share a lot of knowledge on Medicare education. Uh, we can assist in enrollment and then obviously provide you with lifetime support of your Medicare products. Um, we are local. We are no cost. There's no cost to our services. Uh, we are compensated by various insurance companies. Uh, we are unbiased, and we do have our services available in English, Spanish, and Korean. Uh, for those that may have seen me speak or may know me, I like to have fun. I think this quote from the famous uh, management consultant, P Tom Peters, if you're not confused, you're not paying attention. I think that for many of us, uh, we can relate to that when it comes to Medicare. Um, today, quickly, I'll cover these seven points. Uh, I'm going to go over what Medicare A, B, and C, and D is. I'll talk about eligibility for Medicare. I'll also speak about your plan options. I'll speak about enrollment periods and penalties. 
I will talk about Medicare costs, what the government premiums are and how your income impacts them. I will talk about working past 65 because many of us today are working past 65. And then finally, I'll share some great helpful resources to assist you as you go through your Medicare journey. So quickly cover what, what is Medicare. Uh, Medicare is a federal health program. It's for senior, or citizens age 65 and older. There are technically four parts of Medicare, A, B, C, and D, and you'll hear me refer to these frequently during this presentation. Um, I will use the term original Medicare often. This was the initial part of Medicare passed in 1966, and this is parts A and B. Those are the initial parts. Uh, many have heard of a term or a product called Medicare Advantage. That is filed under Part C as in Charlie, and then Part D happens to rhyme with drug. That's the drug plans that have been added. I will cover all of these uh, parts, but just so it's clear, Medigap for the conversation is technically not part of the federal Medicare program. It's a secondary payer. So who is eligible? Again, uh, U.S. citizens and legal residents. Um, there is a caveat here that you must be in the United States for at least five consecutive years prior to enrolling in Medicare. There are other individuals that are eligible. If you're under the age of 65, uh, you can uh, apply if you are disabled, a qualifying disability, and also if you are diagnosed with end-stage renal disease or ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, that would also give you uh, access to Medicare benefits earlier than 65. Uh, Medicare plan options. The reason that we put this slide in here early is because I try to simplify up front how you will go about your Medicare benefits. Now, what I'm going to discuss here is someone who does not have access to, say, TRICARE, VA benefits, some kind of former health uh, benefits through a retire or health retirement benefits through your former employer, uh, FEHB, Federal Employee Health Benefits. Those are different scenarios because of the access to those types of benefits. What I'm going to discuss here are for the people that are entering Medicare with no alternatives other than enrolling fully into the Medicare program. So I call this option one because as you'll see there are basically two options that you have to make your decision when you enter into Medicare. Uh, the first option one is you would have original Medicare. This is A and B. Then you would buy a Medigap plan and a prescription drug plan. So under this opportunity, you would have three ID cards. To put a little bit more detail to this uh, solution or this option, um, under this you would get your original Medicare Part A. It would be your primary payer of claims, meaning that when you seek care through any of the 685,000 um, Medicare providers in the country, Medicare Parts A and B would be billed first. And just to summarize, for those that may be unfamiliar with Part A and B, Part A is a very narrow benefit plan. It's going to cover hospital, the actual cost to be in the hospital. It would cover skilled nursing if you were discharged from the hospital stay and needed some rehabilitation. It will cover hospice. If someone's diagnosed with hospice, they will be covered under Part A. And they will also receive home care. So that same individual that might have left the hospital instead of going to skilled nursing went home that skill care could be delivered in the home. For most of us, there's no premium for Part A. We've worked or our spouse has worked, and therefore we are able to access Part A during our retirement Medicare years with no cost. Um, Part B, there is a premium, but for Part B, this is really what we know as real health insurance. And what I mean by this, this is everything I did not mention. Doctor visits, surgical procedures, both outpatient and inpatient, a doctor would be billed under Part B. Labs tests, durable medical equipment, PT, ST, OT, urgent care, all of that is going to be under Part B as in boy. So A and B are your primary payer. And then to receive prescription drug benefits under this option, you would enroll in Part D as in drug. So these would be two cards. You'd get your red, white, and blue Medicare card and a separate Part D drug plan. The drug plan just so you know, it's going to be for what we call self-administered, orally ingested medications. They can be uh, picked up at local pharmacies. They can also be accessed through mail order, depending on the plan you choose. Their plans all cover generic and brand name drugs. So it's similar to what you have today. There are some uh, differences in how you probably have historically accessed a payment for prescription drugs, but it does operate as you would normally do uh, access for your prescriptions. 
A Medigap would be the third component of this. As mentioned earlier, Medigap is a secondary payer. So in this situation, if someone enrolled in A and B and had a claim that went through A and B, after A and B pays, you would then have that claim forwarded or adjudicated to your Medigap provider who would pay as a secondary payer. In order to get Medigap, you must be enrolled in A and B. You uh, will see that this, for example, covers the 20% of Part B. I didn't allude to this earlier, but Medicare Part B pays 80% after a $203 deductible this year. There's a 20% exposure on average that you as a customer has uh, or client of Medicare. This will fill in those gaps. There's other deductibles and such that this will pay. Um, one thing that's important to know that when you are considering Medigap, the plans are standardized. They did this since 2011. So a Plan G, for example, for you that know what a Plan G is, it's just a letter indicating certain benefits. It's the same no matter what company you would purchase that from. It's an important thing to understand. And that lastly, premiums will be based on your age, gender, your smoker status, and residence. This is an insurance product. This is written by private insurance companies. It operates uh, like a lot of things that require underwriting and such in the uh, insurance world, things that actuaries look at. So you will notice that claims will, or costs and premiums will vary amongst the different companies that sponsor these plans in Virginia. Um, option two is, I alluded earlier, this really was created in 1997, but came into popularity in 2006, because what happened in 2006 with the passing of the prescription drug plan, Part D, Medicare Advantage kind of came to life in that now, if you enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, everything I just described would be administered under either a health plan or by an insurance company. So you can, companies such as Kaiser Permanente is a health plan, but they offer Medicare Advantage. Companies like United Healthcare, Aetna, Humana, Anthem offer Medicare Advantage plans. They're insurance companies, but all of those offer the plan C called Medicare Advantage. And to show you the visual here, you'll see three columns are exactly the same as I alluded. Part C, what you see in red, is a combination of A, B, and D, all administered again by either a private insurance company or a health plan. And when you do this, most of these plans are going to be, if not all, are going to be network-based. They're going to have some form of in-network benefit, an HMO-style plan that you would get your care within their network of doctors. Uh, we have seen recently in uh, the last couple of years PPO plans being introduced, which allow you to go into the network or to pay additional costs to leave the network. Uh, one thing that you notice with Medicare Advantage, because health insurance and, and insurance companies are running this, is they're going to be more of that managed care model. So for people that are familiar with health insurance, managed care. So they're going to get involved and offer you things like dental vision and hearing, for example, that aren't typically available under original Medicare uh, solution. Medicare itself, A, B, C, and D, or C, A, B, and D do not cover dental vision and hearing as far as things like your routine cleanings, annual exams, uh, a vision uh, annual uh, vision exam, a hearing, audiology. A lot of those just baseline tests are not covered under Medicare. Now, advanced care would be covered. Um, so they're going to give you gym memberships on Medicare Advantage. Some give transportation and other benefits. Uh, so this is what I'm trying to explain to you here is that when you enter into Medicare, just to be clear, you're going to make one of these two decisions. Again, assuming you don't have some form of other benefits. So now that we know that there's two options that we can pick, when can we enroll? When is it uh, our time to enroll? And really there's going to be two most common enrollment periods. Um, this is what's known as your IEP or initial enrollment period. As you can see from my graphic, it's a seven month window around your 65th birthday. I'm a September baby. So June, July, and August would be the three months prior to my birthday. If I enroll or apply for my A and B benefits in that window, I will start exactly on September 1st. That's when I would be first eligible. It's important to know if I miss that window, but I need to go on Medicare, I need A and B. If I miss that September 1st deadline, for whatever reason, I would be postponed till October. So I would have a whole month of September without Part B benefits. Part A can be, for conversation's sake, can be retroactively enrolled six months, but more importantly, Part B is the one that we need because, as I mentioned, that's our health insurance. If I missed September and I went into October, I would apply in October. I wouldn't start till December. 
So now I would have gone September, October, November, and I would starting in December, I'd go almost three months, three full months without Part B. The scary part without Part B is I can't buy a Medigap or a Medicare Advantage plan. The reason that I put this up is I want people to understand while your friends or someone might say, oh, you're good, you have seven months to do this enrollment, missing it can have consequences with respect to delayed enrollment. If you miss, and we'll talk about it in a minute, if you miss this completely, there are penalties that will be invoked for the rest of your life. It's important that you know your initial enrollment period. For a lot of people, I think it's important I talk about how do you enroll. Uh, if you do receive Social Security income benefits prior to 65, three months before you turn 65, you will get your red, white, and blue Medicare mail to you, card mailed to you and it will be the start date of the first of the month that you turn 65. This happens automatically. The good news there, you don't have to do anything. For the rest of us that may have delayed our Social Security enrollment to some future date, whatever that date is, is relevant, but we're forced to enroll in Medicare at 65 because we have no other health insurance, we have to proactively apply for our A and B benefits. And as I have a note here, the government will not notify you of saying, hey, John, you're turning 65 in September. Make sure you apply for Medicare. You will receive no notifications if you're not on Social Security. Just want to help share with COVID some things have changed. If you're turning 65 under your IEP, the best way to do it is to set up an SSA.gov account. It takes just a few minutes. You will have to provide verification of who you are. But once you start that SSA.gov account or have it, three months prior to your 65th birthday, you log in under benefits, you will see start a Medicare application and you can do it entirely online. Um, in person used to be a great option, but with COVID, obviously that has been modified. Uh, you can make an appointment, but they will only do it under certain circumstances where I guess unable to uh, do it on an alternative way. You can always mail what's called your 40B. Uh, that's a form that Medicare requires to apply for Part B into your local office. There is a website that will help you find your local office. And then you can make an appointment over the phone uh, and do your enrollment. One warning there is it's not an immediate call today and they enroll you. They will make an appointment typically four to six weeks into the future. So again, be cognizant if you're enrolling 90 days prior to your birth month, take into account if you are gonna do a phone enrollment that your appointment date could be in the future. So enrollment penalties, I alluded to this quickly before, but I'll talk about it real quick. If you miss your initial enrollment period, you could face lifetime penalties under part B and D. So part B is in boy using my September date because that's when I would enroll in Medicare. If I go from this September, say, past next September, and I don't apply for Part B, and I'm supposed to, I would get a 10% penalty right away for one year, being more than 12 months of not getting Part B. That 10% is calculated off what's called the Medicare base premium. That for this year is $148.50. So using that $148.50, I would pay $14.85 if I enrolled before the second year. If I make it two years without enrolling, I would have a 20% penalty. If I went three years, 30%. So it's very important to know when you're turning 65 what actions you have to take, regardless of whether it's enrollment or not enrolling, you have to know your what you need to do. Uh, if you don't do it properly, the government, as you can see here, will penalize you. The same thing applies for Part D. If you miss your initial enrollment period, the seven months around your 65th birthday, and you have no alternative what's called creditable coverage, meaning that your prescription drug coverage that you receive is equal to or better than Medicare standards, you will begin immediately to incur a 1% penalty for every month that you went without that creditable coverage. So I'll just put an example. I am a September birthday again. If I didn't enroll in prescription by December of the year I'm eligible, Starting that January, I would accumulate a 1% per month for every month I went without. And the caveat there is that I can only enroll in a prescription drug plan if I miss my initial enrollment period during what's called the annual enrollment period, which we'll talk about, which is in October to start in the next January. 
point is I would get a 12% penalty if I missed my initial enrollment period's eligibility for Part D because I'd wait 12 months. That's 12% times what's called the national premium benefit average, which is approximately $33. Point is I would be penalized approximately $4 every month for the rest of my life when I enroll in Part D if I missed one year. If I missed two, three, four years, it compounds. I don't tell you this to scare you. I tell you this to understand that there are decisions that you have to make when you are approaching Medicare age. Medicare premiums in your income, um, for those that may be unfamiliar, Medicare will adjust your premiums higher if you're considered a high income earner. This chart will show Part B. The same chart as far as the income levels go is also applicable for Part D. The numbers for Part D are less each month, but they are there. Uh, for time's sake, I just don't go into both of them, but I can share this information if you want to contact me afterwards, if you're interested in learning about IRMA and Part D as well, or Part B. But in a nutshell, the government will look back two years. So if you're applying for Medicare right now to say start before the end of this year, they will look at your 2019 tax return and they will get off at a number called your MAGI or Modified Adjusted Gross Income. When they get that amount of money, they will correlate that to a premium. In this case, as you see, the 148.50 would be for an individual under 88 or over or under 176. And as you see, that amount goes up as we get to those different thresholds. Okay, I know I've gone through a lot right here. Um, Beth, I'll take a pause. And if you have some questions, I can answer them right now. Yeah, actually, thanks, John. Um, Blanca has one to read. I think we have several that are really related. Um, and Blanca, maybe you can start us off and then um, we'll go from there. Okay, um, this is Blanca. So the uh, one of the questions is, for someone whose spouse still working and who still has health insurance, does that person need to enroll? Yeah, what I'd like to do is I will cover that in the next section right here. The key thing, and I'll say it again, is the size of that spouse's employer. If they're over 20 employees, that spouse can remain on the health insurance till that till the actual employee, their spouse retires. If they're under 20 employees, that not, that spouse has to go on Medicare. Okay. First, a couple of people wrote in with that same kind of question. So um, if that didn't answer it, please feel free to write in again if we can clarify anything further. But um, thanks, John. Yeah, and then here's, here's one other question maybe you're going to address later, but we'll just throw it in there. Yeah. Um, if, if your income goes down, retire or otherwise, they lower the premium for future years. Yeah. So this chart here, I'm on the wrong screen, this chart here, if you retire this year, and I'm just going to make very easy numbers, I'm single, and I made 100000 two years ago, um, they would say that, that uh, I owe $207. However, if I'm only going to make 50000 this year because of my retirement, I actually can appeal that. And then even if I don't appeal that, they would adjust it the next year because then they would look at my 2021 return or 2020 for 2022. And if that 2020 number is down, they would adjust down. And in the same sense, if you had a windfall of income, your cost could go up. It's a two year look back. The form is called an SSA 44. If you are in a situation where you want to appeal that, um, again, if you have further questions, you can call my office. But that is a common question. So thanks for that, Beth. Okay, I think we're good for now. We'll move ahead, John. Yeah, it says here my screen is paused. Can you guys see my screen still or no? Yes, we see it. Okay, that's weird. Okay, so working past 65, um, this is always, we put this in our slide, although this is preparing for 65 enrollment because of those questions that we get. And again, I'll answer any questions even after I do this because it can be confusing. So there's really three things that you want to look at here uh, when you're turning 65 or addressing a spouse turning 65. The key thing is, number one, is the size of the employer. This is the federal government's guideline. This is not something we make up or any arbitrary number. It's 20. If that employer has 20 or more employees, so clearly uh, an organization like Virginia Hospital Center or if you work for Arlington County, these are large employers, over 20 people. 
you can delay your enrollment into Medicare because Medicare deems your coverage as creditable, meaning it meets or exceeds Medicare standards, and you can just remain on your health insurance until you or your spouse actually retires. Um, I have a small organization. We have just under 20 people. So I would have to go on Medicare if I turned 65 because I don't meet that 20 employee threshold. So I would have to enroll under that initial enrollment period when I turn 65. That's why we cover that and I go into it in such detail to tie that loop is if you are under that 20 employee, you need to understand to take action. Just the fact that you have health insurance and like it is not gonna leave you in a good situation. Um, so the 20 employee size is the first decision. Um, the second part, which you'll get a notice from your employer's health plan or employer every October, that your Part D technically is creditable. What I mean by that is that your prescription drug benefit meets or exceeds the Medicare standards. You'll get that notice, and many already might be getting that notice from pe previous years and you're still working. It will say for the coming year, 2022, of this year in October, your prescription coverage meets Medicare standards or is considered creditable, you don't have to do anything. Should you get a notification that says your coverage is not creditable, you would need to take action within 63 days of losing that coverage or you would enter into that penalty phase. But Excuse having, me, Excuse yep. me I'm, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, it looks like your slide is not advancing. Are you able to um, advance that? Do you see it now? No, we see you. Let me see. Let's see if. This was that problem I had earlier. Yeah, let's see if we can. Um, it says click yeah. to search. This exact same problem I had earlier where it's freezing my screen. There you go. Um, yeah, yep. we can see it now. I'm back? Yes. Yeah. So sorry yeah. about that, guys. I, no I, problem. And just let me um, actually put in a, a reminder to the audience. We will be sending a copy of these slides out at, later on. So for <laughs> any of you that want to digest it, there's a lot to, to digest, but we'll, we'll send that out. Thanks, thanks John. Yeah, no, I, thank you. I, I, everyone, I'm very sorry. Uh, I think we're still all adopting to a technical world of webinars. Anyway. Uh, to just visit my last point, uh, when you are deemed creditable coverage and you have this large employer coverage, you in the future create what's called a special enrollment period. You'll see that as bullet point three. The special enrollment period basically grants you a second opportunity because you missed the initial enrollment, justifiably so, to enroll in Medicare without any penalties or delays and things like that. So if I work till 68 for a large employer, the hospital center, and I decide to retire at 68, I would then apply at 68 just as if I was 65, have the same rights to enroll in Medicare A, B, C, D, Medigap, all those uh, products without any penalties. Now, there is a window that you have to do it, eight months, uh, the special enrollment period for, um, I'm sorry, the special enrollment period under an SEP uh, loss of employer group health plan is an eight month window. So you get eight months from which to apply for A and B. You also, in that eight month window, remember though, you don't wanna go more than 63 days without prescription drug coverage. So you would need at least part A to get part D. I know this is where it gets confusing. Uh, point being, we typically recommend if you are, if you know your retirement date 90 days prior, just like the IEP to begin your application process to begin your part A and B. And then you can do the secondary benefits, whether it's plan C, plan D, or a Medigap plan, and all, start all your benefits on the first of your retirement month without any breaks in coverage. It's very important. Another thing that I want to point out here that happens is that COBRA is not considered creditable coverage. So when you turn 65 and then you are offered COBRA as part of a retirement or what have you, it does not work like COBRA under 65. What do I mean by that? Under 65, COBRA health insurance acts exactly like health insurance. It pays all your claims. Under Medicare, if you don't have A or B prior to getting COBRA, when you enroll in A and B, your COBRA is instantly terminated. 
if you have part A and you're offered COBRA, part A is a primary payer, COBRA is the secondary payer, that's why I was saying it can't be a primary payer, you have no part B at that point because you haven't applied for it and COBRA would only address the 20% that Medicare doesn't cover. So if you are offered COBRA, your exposure is sadly that part B, typically that 80% under part B that's not being covered because you don't have part B. Uh, if you have questions about COBRA and Medicare, just call our office. This is definitely a part of Medicare that you do not want to make a mistake in. Also, real quick, if you are working past 65, uh, you don't want to fund an HSA and have Medicare. If you have any parts of Medicare and you're funding an HSA at 65, you either have to enroll uh, or stay in your HSA or enroll in Medicare Part A and you would have to cancel your HSA. Um, I point out here that how do you actually apply during a special enrollment period? Because it's got one different step between this and the turning 65, is that you have to get what's called the CMS L-564. That is a form from your employer that certifies that you've had creditable coverage. By getting that form, you can again, like I indicated, enter into Medicare without any penalties, delays, that kind of uh, situation that you may be afraid of because you have this 564 that certifies that you've had those creditable benefits. During that SEP, you can still apply online. You can actually mail or fax your applications into your local office. If you Google SSA locator, you'll find your local office by putting in your zip code and the information associated with that. And again, without uh, in a pre-COVID world or in a special situation, you can go into your local office. I'll wrap up here with some good helpful things, uh, helpful resources. The SSA.gov, it, it doesn't mean scheduling or enrolling in SSA or applying for an account there that you're getting your benefits. I'm 55, I have an SSA account, I can monitor what my income will be at retirement, but by having that account, I am not activating any government benefits right now, I can monitor it. So if you know you're gonna be retiring in the future, just set up an SSA.gov account, obviously write down your username and password, and know that you can access this when you turn 65 if you need to apply for Medicare through this. Medicare.gov obviously is the Medicare website, all the information you need there. Uh, MyMedicare.gov is a website that you would access once you are a Medicare beneficiary. That will give you information on your claims, uh, your payments, the plans and products that you're enrolled in. It's a very helpful tool. There's a Medicare app if you have a smartphone. If you uh, go, uh, go into your store and put in uh, Medicare What's Covered is the name of it. It's a free app. It will tell you how Medicare covers various medical services. And then our website, medicareportal.org, is an educational website. There's no solicitation or sales of any kind. Uh, we feel like we've taken a lot of the core components that the medicare.gov site has, and we've tried to simplify them for your knowledge and experience. Um, we are available. Uh, we have a local office. We can come to you or you can come to our office. I also encourage you, again, again in a COVID-free world, the SSA offices are obviously a very good resource. And then finally, as we'll hear in a minute, your area agency on aging, whether it's in Arlington or if you live in a surrounding county, they all have an office, are great resources for really insurance, but also Medicare services. I'll wrap up with some final thoughts and then I can answer more questions uh, or we can get more questions later. Medicare is confusing and frustrating. That's fine. We understand that. Uh, there's organization like ours that will help you um, start early, uh, again, with the penalties as well as you don't wanna go without coverage. You wanna start early, uh, research your options, learn about the local plans and what's available uh, to you so that you can find out what works best for you. Um, oops, I just, my screen just went blank. Sorry guys, hold on a second. Um, select the policies that work best for you. Oop, it says I'm paused again. We can see your final thought sl uh, slide. Yep, okay, so select the policies that work for you. Again, there's those two options. You wanna to research to find the ones that best work for you. You wanna select the plans that meet your medical needs first. We've always said that your health is paramount. So find the plans that will keep you with your doctors, with your prescriptions. Changing those obviously can be uh, very catastrophic. I don't wanna think that way, but make sure that you're able to stay with your medical providers 
uh, when you transition into Medicare. Uh, again, you can call your providers. There's resources online to check the, the uh, networks of the various health plans, as well as you can check with Medicare. Um, Medicare is an individual decision. I didn't go into this deeply, but if you and your spouse are entering Medicare, uh, it is two separate policies. So where you might be together today uh, through an employer, uh, when you go on Medicare, you're considered two separate people. And then lastly, know your costs. Uh, I went into the Part B. There's also a Part D, Irma. You know, there's the base premium for Part B. There'll be premiums potentially associated with your Part C, your Part D, and your Medigap. So make sure that you know those costs so that you can budget into your uh, finances. I think that's everything, Beth. Or Kate, rather. I'm sorry. That's everything I have. No problem. I, I'll, go, I'll go by anything. So, um, John, let's, there's a few people in the audience that, again, have a very similar question, kind of what you touched on earlier, but I think it's worth um, uh, reviewing again. So I'm going to read you a scenario that somebody sent in, if you don't mind, pretty oh. brief. Um, the spouse, spouse works at large company and has employer health insurance. Um, and, and spouse two is covered under that plan and turns 65 first. Does that spouse who's turning 65 have to apply at 65 or do they uh, get the credible coverage provision? Yeah, again, that's, that's, what I read? Yep, that's the magic number of 20. So if that working spouse, their employer is over 20 employees, that non-working spouse or not would, would be able to continue to stay on that health plan indefinitely until the working spouse retired and lost benefits. Under 20, they would have to go on Medicare. Okay. Thank you, John. Are there any forms to fill out at 65 to get the SEP delay? No. Nope. Sounds good. Okay, I think, well, if you don't mind, John, would you could you flip it over to Galore? And then we can get into her presentation. There she is. And um, take more questions after she has a chance to speak and present her yep. information. Thank you Thank so you. much. Here we go. Thank you, John. And we'll let Glory have a minute. There we go. We see your slide, Glory. If you want to do the um, presentation format, that would be great. To make it a little bigger. Perfect. All okay, right. Good. Good morning, everyone. My name is Galare Basiri, and I'm with Arlington County Area Agency on Aging. I'm an outreach specialist and caregiver specialist here in Arlington County. We uh, rely on uh, numbers to provide. Um, okay. Um, to provide much needed services and programs for our residents in Arlington County. Over the next two decades, the proportion of the U.S. population over age 60 will dramatically increase um, as our boomers reach uh, this milestone. By the year 2030, more than 70 million or one in five Americans will be 65 or older, as the baby boomers are largely responsible for this increase um, in our older population as they began turning 65 in the year 2011. Roughly 14% of the population are ages 60 and over in Arlington County, and um, it shows the most significant increase occurred for adults ages 65 to 74 years of age and adults ages 45 to 49 years of age. A, um, a trend projected to steadily increase in future years. Since 2010, there has been the 30% increase in adults ages 65 to 74, and 7% increase in adults 75 to 84 years of um, 
years old. So in Arlington County, 74% of our adults are have bachelor degrees or higher. It's a very rich diversity here in Arlington County. There are 107 languages um, that is spoken here in Arlington County public schools, average home values of $650,000, a median household income is $110,000. An average um, uh, rental, monthly rental, is $1,900. We have a high level of community engagement. We have 62 registered civic and citizen association in Arlington County, 59 advisory board and commissions, 178 community um, services organizations. And now when we talk uh, about levels of support and care, as you can see, the highest level of need is when someone needs 24 hours of care, which is the level that is provided in nursing homes. If you need 24 hours care or more, that's a nursing home criteria. Then we have assisted living that if you need one of your daily activities or two or more, or if you need um, medication assistance, you'll be in assisted living. Then there are medical and skilled care, home-based um, services in our county um, that is involuntarily, you can call us and there are home care services we can refer to you or provide for you the names of the companies you can call. We have community living program that is in-home support if you're need is less they help you with medication with support with one or two more of your uh, daily living activities then we have community-based support which is transportation shopping uh, money management and other things that we can provide and then we are the community resource and information support uh, in Arlington County Area Agency, we are the window to a lot of these supports that you might need. Of course, planning for the future is very personal and uh, everyone needs to think of their own situation, their own support system and um, their own preferences, but we are here um, to help. In Arlington County, um, we are very fortunate to have um, state funds and uh, local funds. Uh, our state funds are through divisions of rehabilitation services or DARS for sure. Um, we help plan, coordinate and direct uh, all of our services uh, with compliance to local by local and federal laws. Um, these uh, services that are through Older American Act, um, we have nutritional services, health and wellness, supportive services, uh, caregiver support, and elder law and legal services um, that we provide. These are all core uh, services, our Older uh, American Act. Mm -hmm. But one of the services that we provide, one of the um, top um, services that we provide is actually VICAP, which is not one of the uh, Older American Act. As I said, we are the window to services and uh, to information. This is our entry point. If you need to reach us, 703-228-1700 or by email, or you can reach us through our uh, website and to find out the services that we provide. This is a, a one-stop uh, uh, option kind of <clears throat> that can provide and connect you to all the services. Now, the most common non-core uh, service that we provide in our area agency on aging in Arlington is our uh, VICAP program or Virginia Insurance Counseling Program. Uh, we are staff and volunteer-based program. Every 
each and every volunteer and staff uh, who works with VICAP is certified um, through uh, the local, through the uh, state, and we pass a yearly exam to stay certified and stay up to date with all the changes that occur. Um, and we provide this kind of services for free. And we are located in our DHS buildings in 2100 Washington Boulevard in Arlington. And we measure our performance and the quality of the work that we offer to our uh, participants through surveys. We have Frequently, we have surveys that uh, uh, we share with our participants to let, to let us know how we are doing. Now, a medical uh, counseling or VICAP uh, provides a lot of services that you can see in the slides. We have in-depth individual counseling for Medicare Part A, B, C, and D, or we can assist with uh, studying different kind of Medicap to see what fits your budget and your family situation. We offer Medicare classes throughout the year, and some of them you can find in our website. We help resolve Medicare claims and billing issues that you might have. We assist with filling for Medicare related benefits. We assist with understanding Medicaid and long-term care insurance that a lot of people uh, sometimes need when they run out of their resources. We provide assistance with understanding eligibility and applications for low-income assistance programs. And um, you can call us if you need this counseling appointment that is for free with our phone number 228-1725, or you can email us with the Medicare help at Arlington VA. Now, uh, open enrollment, as John talked about, what is it? It's an opportunity for new and existing Medicare beneficiaries to join Medicare drug plan, change uh, into a new plan, and drug plan or Part C, Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, open enrollment uh, starts in October 15th through December 7th, and the coverage starts in the January of the next year. Um, so it is good to be proactive, to look at everything that you need to investigate all the systems, all the insurances that you want before the enrollment starts. So that's why we get really busy from September to the enrollment period. Um, now, how we can help uh, in YCAP, beneficiaries can get very in-depth assistance from certified, trained Medicare counselors and understand the selection um, that they're choosing um, and the, for their healthcare needs uh, for the open enrollment. We partner with Senior Medicare Patrol, um, mainly because billions of federal dollars are lost every year due to healthcare fraud, errors, or abuse. So Senior Medicare Patrol or SMP empowers and assists Medicare beneficiaries, their families, and their caregivers to prevent, detect, and report healthcare fraud, errors, or abuse. In partnership with uh, SMP, we um, educate people with Medicare and identify. Uh, theft and identify fraud. SMP has active program in all states and District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Island and Guam as well. Uh, SMP always seeks volunteers, so if you're interested, please do contact them. And um, we, they receive com complaints for Medicare and they address that and we do that in partnership with them. So you can see their emails, you can see their website, you can see their 1-800 number. Please do contact them for any information that you would need. Now caregivers. Uh, we have very strong feeling for our caregivers in Arlington County. Uh, 
according to AARP, 43.5 million caregivers provide unpaid care every year. And the economic value of that per year is $450 billion. Whereas Medicare spending per year, Medicaid spending per year is $154 billion. So you can understand the value of caregiving. So caregiving often happens very gradually. If we try to make an appointment for a loved one or for a friend or for a neighbor or prepare food or do some shopping, we slipped into the, the caregiver role without knowing it. And often caregivers need a lot of help. And when you have to deal with Medicare, that is so confusing. Um, the help is available. We are there. YCAP is there. You can reach out to YCAP for, hair, uh, for help. Oftentimes, caregivers need to navigate Medicare for their loved ones to get what to see what kind of help they can get, what kind of savings they can have. So please do contact us for questions about loved ones plan you can contact us or in the back of their insurance card there are numbers that you can call but then again it's a lot of run around so we are here and this is a free service to everyone if you like to use it um, for guidance on home health services medicare covers visits um, please do visit us call us, we can help in that. For general resources near you, the, their administration on aging or elder care locators, um, there are pharmacy coupons, their assistance program that we can help you navigate and um, a caregiver action network, which is an online network, is caregiveraction.org, is a wonderful resource and then uh, 1-800-MEDICARE is always a great resource too. So as we said, we are um, uh, Area Agency on Aging and Disabilities Resource Center. Our number is 228-1700. <clears throat> and you can reach us in our mailbox uh, with the email address and the website and our Virginia Insurance Counseling Program, our YCAP is 703-228-1725. Um, I have other numbers here for you for, for emergency mental health if you need it, for non-emergency police, for senior Medicare patrol or SMP that I talked about, a national abuse hotline that we educate our caregivers and our community about um, elder abuse as well. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here today and uh, I'm here and ready for any kind of um, um, questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Galore. That was wonderful. Um, lots of in-depth information. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, this is such a uh, meaty topic and um, a lot to digest, but I hope if, I just wanna remind you, you'll get the copy of this presentation, you'll get the recording, and now you also have um, two great contacts and two great organizations that you can turn to if you want additional help. And as I said, these are free services. So certainly tap into um, the Arlington Area Agency on Aging, as well as John's Medical Portal. Um, either one could do some follow up with you. Um, let's see, so actually one of the questions we got that I will address, and to be honest, it's not Medicare related, but it, it has to do with us here at VHC, so I will answer that. And that was, somebody was asking if um, we have uh, resources for seniors at the hospital. And I just wanna remind everyone that yes, um, I work in the senior health department along with Blanca. We are available to help you with different programs and services that we offer. And I'm gonna make sure to include our website and our email address in my follow-up communication so that if you're somebody that's looking for uh, just senior resources, you can certainly um, come to us and we'll do the best that we can. Uh, let's see here, I'm, as I'm, let me just scan the questions real quick before we, we've got a few minutes here. Um, Let's see here. And Blanco, feel free to jump in if you 
see anything. Um, um, I do actually see one where it says to please thank the uh, presenters um, that the person came here to get um, Medicare info for herself, but now she also ha um, can get information for her mother. So that's great. Help everyone out. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. That's great, great, great. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just take this other question here. Um, if I'm covered by my employer's health insurance because they have over 20 employees, when I turn 65 next month but become unemployed during my IEP, what are the implications for enrolling in Medicare? Anyone want to take that one? If, I mean, I, kid, I can answer that. Okay, so thanks, John. When you lose employer coverage anytime after 65, you want to do your enrollment obviously within that applicable period. The IEP, even though you're losing employer insurance, the IEP would be enforced because you're turning 65. And just for a conversation, it is the most powerful enrollment period. So if you had a pecking order, IEP always applies first. So that individual, if they're losing coverage next month and turning 65, they would have that same seven month window that they would need to calculate very carefully to make sure they enroll on time to avoid those penalties and delays. Okay, great, thank you. Let's see, so we're getting just a lot of nice positive comments, guys, a lot of good information and people appreciated that. So um, thank you everyone for or joining us today and thank you so much, John and Glory for um, offering this information. I'm getting people thinking about it. I'm sure it's on your everyone's mind if they're approaching the uh, the 65 year mark. Um, so before we close out here, let me just um, put in a plug for our lecture next month, which will uh, September is Falls Prevention Month. So we're going to be focusing specifically on medications and how different medications and interactions between medications may contribute to your risk falls. We're going to have two pharmacists come on. And talk about that more in depth and really offer some practical tips as well as some questions you can take back to your healthcare provider so that you can um, avoid falls and um, and be safe. So with that, and again, that's going to be September 24th, and I will be including that in the follow-up communication. With that, I'm going to thank you again, John and Gloria. really appreciate your time, and thank you everyone in the audience for your great questions. We'll be sure to send this information out so you can digest it on your own, and I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Take care.